Hey, good evening everyone and welcome to this uh, series of talks. I want to try and uh, cover certain areas in this series, um, quite challenging conditions at the moment and situation, so let's see what's possible. But I hope uh, in this series, um, after a bit of an introduction uh, this evening, um, to uh, go into a little bit more, with a bit more subtlety and refinement, um, certain aspects or areas of the, the whole skill and art uh, or alchemy of um, imaginal practice, sensing with soul. Um, I want to hopefully uh, focus in on um, the whole teaching of the elements of the imaginal, the nodes of the lattice, um, particular elements, and say a bit more about some of them. Perhaps if there's um, opportunity to say a few things about um, soul-making dyad practice, practicing in, in dyads, in twos, uh, maybe maybe something about ritual, we'll see. Um, hopefully to address, uh, again, go into more a little bit of the philosophical sort of underpinnings, uh, the metaphysics, the ontology, the epistemology of uh, that are involved and necessary, if you like, as a basis uh, or to clear enough space for soul-making dharma. Then also perhaps uh, some reflections on the dharma itself, meaning the tradition and our relationship with tradition and the history of that tradition and how soul-making dharma um, places itself or might be placed uh, in relation to that tradition. And uh, lastly, hopefully, uh, something about ethics and to open up that area in, in relation to soul. So let's see, let's see what's possible. Um, tonight, uh, this is, is, is basically an introduction, um, in a way most of the principles I will talk about tonight are uh, things you will have hopefully already have heard, um, but they're, they bear repeating, I think. Um, some of the examples may be new, but um, the just by way of sort of getting us going, placing us, situating ourselves again in, in the territory. So, um, if we talk about the art um, or the alchemy of imaginal practice of sensing the soul, you know, there's a lot involved in that. And uh, actually it presupposes in a way, uh, or at least it involves, um, everything that we bring uh, or, or we learn in, in, if you like, regular Dharma, mainstream Dharma, and also everything we have to deal with. It's um, as part of our Dharma practice is not outside of the sort of um, constituents of soul making practice. So, just like um, a person may be attracted to, uh, say, regular Dharma um, uh, out of um, and come on retreat, for example, and be there and practice out of a deep attraction uh, to the unfabricated, may have heard something or read something, um, maybe not even using that language, but there's this pull, and that's the reason that this particular person is, is practicing. That's the main um, pull in their soul, if you like. <clears throat> and what do they find when they come on retreat and practice um, uh, sincerely and wholeheartedly? And they find they have to deal with, they find uh, they have to meet and work with en route to this uh, realization and opening that they are longing for and and uh, enticed by that en route to that they have to deal 
deal with, meet with, and work with um, pain in the knee, you know, uh, monkey mind, uh, their mother, um, all the psychological patterns and the relational patterns, all that stuff comes up, and it can't just be bypassed and avoided. Um, it's a, uh, in a way, integral part of the path. And so very similarly with soul-making dharma, uh, we may have heard something about images or someone tells us or something attracts us or we've tasted a little a little bit already and got excited and got uh, fallen in love with it even, but we still meet all these other kind of seemingly more mundane um, obstacles, difficulties, challenges, issues, etc., areas of practice that need attention and care and exploration. Uh, So all this is, in a way, when we talk about uh, what's involved in art and alchemy of imaginal practice, sensing with soul, we're actually including all that. And uh, recently we taught this retreat at Guy House, Roots into the Ground of Soul, and Catherine and I were talking a little bit beforehand, saying, oh, because we'd had another retreat called uh, Foundations of Soul Making Dharma, I think the year before, and there was the difference between foundations and roots. Um, so, if, it's not that important, but, uh, but um, if you think about a foundation of a building, it's something that's, if you like, um, it's static, it doesn't grow, it's not organic, it doesn't itself pr- provide nourishment, it's just, it's there... Um, uh, as a basis, it's basic to allowing structure and stability uh, to whatever you want to build on top of that. So we can talk about various foundations of soul-making dharma, you know, energy, body, awareness, basic mindfulness, um, certain insight practices, metta, samatha, the ability to, to kind of calm and gather the mind and well-being. All, all these are foundations, you know, uh, certain skill with the emotions. Um, many of these, and even some of those kind of difficult issues that I uh, talked about, certainly one's mother, or even monkey mind, or one's psychological patterns, one's relation, relational patterns, one's bodily difficulties, um, all of these two can uh, become roots. And a root is something that's organic. In other words, it grows. It's not a fixed... Uh, once and for all uh, structural thing, it it grows, it changes. A root, if you think about the roots of a tree, they grow, they change, they provide nourishment, and they're actually themselves part of the whole living structure. So it's not necessarily uh, with when we talk about foundations or basics of soul making dharma. You need this, and then you can do the soul making dharma. But all those elements that well, most of those elements that seem like foundations can then become themselves in soul. And we'll touch on some of these in, in different examples. So what, you know, it's one thing to be able to be aware of your emotions, to feel them in the body, to have some skill with them. All, all that's great and really indispensable, and we could say those are foundations. And at a certain point, if, if the soul-making practice is, is going and blossoming and... and uh, enriching itself and filling out and exploring those very aspects of um, emotional life, of the heart life, become roots. In other words, they become in soul. The whole way we relate to and conceive of and sense and work with our emotions and our emotional life and how that plays out um, itself becomes uh, sensed with soul. Our Emotions can become imaginal in the sense that they they become images, they become uh, erotic uh, objects for us, if you like. So all this is involved, some of it we're going to touch on in a little bit more detail as we go through these talks, hopefully. Um, but... Uh, there's a lot, I've said this before, there's a lot involved in this, uh, what we're calling the, um, the art and the alchemy of imaginal practice and of sensing the soul. So, you know, sometimes it's worth 
I think for everyone actually it's worth checking just where where am I with all these foundations I've spelled them out before you know um, the energy body uh, skill and awareness with the energy body skill and awareness with the emotions mindfulness metta samatha and all this um, things like that R- relational um, uh, relational skills you know um, just even just emotional capacity you know if we talk about emotional skill many many things are kind of foundational it's worth checking um, or periodically kind of reviewing and asking oneself where am I with all that how 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 solid are my foundations um, which ones are a little bit shaky or actually not even there kind of that brick is missing in in the structural foundation um, because it does demand a lot. Uh, these practices that we're talking about, whole soul making dharma, does demand a lot. It asks a lot. We might hear things and kind of be attracted, but it won't really get off the ground unless uh, many of these pieces are there. So, awareness or uh, realization that as we grow in practice, these very foundations can themselves become. Uh, transformed, can grow, uh, ferment, like rise like bread or, or uh, something with yeast in it and become uh, fuller, richer, more multidimensional, uh, more beautiful, um, uh, all of that as they become ensouled and, and drawn into the soul-making practices. And, okay, so I said tonight... Uh, In this talk, it's really just an introduction, um, but there are some things that bear repeating and uh, kind of reminding reminding ourselves of. So it's worth taking the time to do that. We use a lot of words, um, some of which are kind of familiar sounding but used in a different way, and some will be very unfamiliar sounding to uh, many people. Um, But even words that are becoming, uh, you know, there's somewhat of a renaissance of, of the use of the word soul, for example, or imaginal or eros, words we use a lot. And uh, to recognize, I think I think it's really important to recognize that we are using those words, with words we share in common with other traditions, certain other traditions, but we're using them in very particular ways. And m- m- being clear about those delineations and definitions uh, is, I think, really important um, so that things, uh, certain directions open up that wouldn't otherwise open up. So uh, some, of, some of these words, like image or imaginal in the way that I, I'm using, we're using it, it's, it's hard to sum up what that is succinctly uh, even eros we could give a little formula but it's something um, that needs uh, yes a careful definition but also then the, the living of it and the noticing of it and the recognizing of it and the, and the growing into it and it growing in us um, when we say soul uh, we um, mean something like we could could give a, a, a short definition, a succinct definition of soul, which I'll do uh, in a minute. But also to say, with any definition we give um, or a concept we use, that there's a sort of dance on a razor's edge between precision and clarity and differentiation from uh, other closely related concepts or other usages of the same word in different traditions. There's that on the one on the one hand, this uh, need for clarity, precision, differentiation, and on the other hand, the the concepts and the words we use need to, need to be able themselves to grow. So we don't want to pin something down conceptually or by definition in a way that's so tight that it uh, it it then gets restricted and 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 cannot be organic. Um, so a word like soul has to retain a little bit, little bit of kind of a space to grow, and b um, kind of fuzziness, what we call soft and elastic edges. Um, so that's uh, uh, an element of the imaginal, one of the nodes you'll recognise. But it also applies to the concepts that we use as well. So there's this dance on the razor's edge between precision, clarity, differentiation on one hand 
and a kind of, let's call it mystery, an organic mystery, perhaps, on the other, on the other hand. So, having said that, we could give a de- definition of what we mean by soul as something like the following. Soul is that which, uh, we say looks, but really senses, that which senses in ways that uh, are soul-making, or that increase soul-making. Uh, so soul is that which senses in ways that feel soul-making. Uh, and again, we'd have to explain what does soul-making mean. We've, we've talked about that before. Um, the resonances, the depths, the dimensionality, etc., et all that. So soul, we're using that word loosely to mean that which looks or senses in ways that support and deepen and open and increase the sense of soul-making. And it's that which wants to look in these ways, wants to sense in these ways. So axiomatic to our whole paradigm is that the soul loves soul-making, the soul wants soul-making. Okay, and so when we talk about soul making, it's that this this organ of um, it's an organ of perception, it, it, uh, of sensing in the ways that uh, are soul making, uh, and it's also an organ of desire. It wants that. So there's a uh, we're including sensitivities and also desire and eros as part of uh, this organ that we're calling soul. It's an organ of perception and an organ of desire. So that's a sort of fairly succinct um, definition, but it leaves quite a lot of room uh, for growth, for different ideas and and vantage points and angles um, on it. So, for example, we can definitely conceive of my soul, that in me, if you like, that organ in me, which... um, senses in ways that open up soul making and that and that wants to sense in those ways or we can talk about the soul if you like we could talk about a world soul or a cosmic soul um, that's operating um, in me or through me there's different logoi different ideas about whose soul is it what's actually happening here um, or sometimes, again, just to touch on uh, dyad practice, and you might have experienced this either with practicing with another, with a dyad or in a group, it's, it's soul making, that actually there is, this feels to be a kind of, if you like, soul of the dyad. And it's uh, both independent and dependent of the, the, the two people that make up that dyad or, or the people that make up that group. And this... Um, dyadic soul, if you like, is kind of a third, if you like, there's me and this person I'm in the dyad with, and there's a third that seems, and it kind of encompasses us, but it's sort of separate, and sort of includes us, and we sort of include it, Um, but that's where the soul is, and again, we are, perhaps, we as members of the dyad are constituent parts of that, or whatever, so there's different logoi, for example, uh, that we can bring to bear on how we're conceiving of soul at any time. And this will will uh, either be opened up through practice, uh, through experience, and also the different logoi as we kind of take them for a spin a little bit, hold them, entertain them lightly. They also allow different kinds of experience to open up. So as always, there's a very intimate relationship between perception, experience, and conception. Uh, in this case, I'm just drawing attention to how they how they influence each other. Perception influences conception. Conception influences perception. But the actual the intimacy is even deeper than that. And so, uh, so we talk about soul. We talk about images. I'm not going to. I'm going to talk about images tonight a little bit, but uh, I'm not going to attempt some kind of succinct definition there. But remember. Just actually a few reminders of what we mean Um, when we say imaginal. uh, We introduce the term sensing the soul as a sort of equivalent term or interchangeable term, but one that um, reminds us more of the possibilities that um, images are not necessarily just intra-psychic. It's something that happens 
uh, with my eyes closed as some completely private object. So I could be looking at this lamp or this desk or this this book or, or whatever it is or my body, something that other people would agree is there in a kind of uh, socially agreed upon perception. But the way that I am seeing it, I'm sensing it with soul. It has dimensionality, it has meaningfulness, it has beauty, there's eros towards it. There's uh, all, all those other elements of the imaginal. So when we say image, we mean intrapsychic, but also extrapsychic, if you like. Um, sensing with soul, encompassing, and the word imaginal, both of them encompassing all of that, using them interchangeably. Um, but just the, the phrase sensing with soul as a, as a reminder that we're not just talking about private intrapsychic images. We're also talking about perceptions of commonly agreed upon um, things, objects, situations in the world which are sensed with the soul, sensed in a soul-making way. Um, I'll leave aside trying to define Eros for now. I've done done uh, plenty of that in the past. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other terms, but uh, I think tonight we just want to touch on um, image and imaginal. And just to say soul-making dharma also includes, as we said, much that isn't obviously just image, uh, or all kinds of other aspects um, around that, or that create a platform, a basis to allow that, um, etc. And soul-making, in a way, also happens any time the, man, the mind kind of... Uh, or the heart, the experience, expands its frontiers in ways that feel meaningful and enriching and uh, deepening. Um, and some of those might not be through images or sensing the soul. So, again, just some reminders, but I think it's somehow worth, worth uh, they're worthwhile reminders. So when we talk about um, image. Mostly I use the word image to mean imaginal image, but I'll uh, um, qualify that in, in a second. Um, but when we talk about imaginal practice, it's uh, where, despite some of the similarities, we want to really um, delineate it from um, shamanism, for example, and um, uh, from such uh, explorations as, for, for example, energy healing or extrasensory perception, there's overlaps here. So the territory is not that cut and dry, but I really feel that it's worth um, kind of carving out a very specific area that we're calling imaginal practice in differentiation from, despite some of the overlaps, in differentiation from some of these other areas. Um, because um, imaginal practice is quite rare, and it's r rarer than, I suppose, the, those other areas. And it's more likely that it will, if we mix these um, areas of exploration up, <clears throat> it's likely that the imaginal will be the first one that's lost. First one that's kind of diluted and um, its power and its potential uh, to open up certain doorways and directions uh, gets lost because it's just confused with other um, idioms and uh, uh, traditions and explorations. So... We're not really, despite some of the similarities and some of the overlap, and I find it very interesting, you know, some of these other areas, certainly, but I just feel I have a, a duty to make clear what we mean by this particular area called imaginal practice in contradistinction to some of these others. So we're not talking about channeling. Imaginal practice is not channeling. It's not shamanism. It's not energy healing. It's not ESP. It's not... Um, seeing ghosts. Um, it's not either uh, qu quite equatable with Buddhist Tantra. Um, again, lots of, lots of similarities, lots of overlap, but not the same thing. So not saying this imaginal 
paradigm, the paradigm of the imaginal and soul making and that whole path is not better or worse. I've said all this before, I'm just repeating. Um, it's not necessarily more or less or advanced or anything like that, but it's different and in significant ways. So, again, if we assume that our soul making, our imaginal path and practice is the same as any of those other areas, it's it's particular avenues, the particular avenues that come with the imaginal, the openings, the creation discoveries, they won't open. Um, because the certain presumptions, or uh, whether they're implicit or explicit, in, in the operating logos, in the conception of, of these other uh, um, paths, even if I'm not conscious of that, um, they will fabricate experience along different lines, along certain lines, and uh, with certain constraints. Um, and in a way, we'll get off on the wrong foot um, or divert into some other area. So, like we said, w- there's a lot of overlap in in words, soul and image and soul making and. Um, but there are differences, um, especially in the f- philosophical view um, regarding ontology and epistemology and um, all of that. Uh, this imaginal middle way, neither real nor not real, for example, being one of the key differences. And also the fundamental intention of soul making practice and imaginal practice being fullness, what we call the fullness of intention, the intention for soul making, if you like, above all else, including other intentions for healing and all kinds of other things. But um, this <coughs> primary uh, intention for soul making, or the fullness of intention to include everything but uh, paramount is the intention for soul making. These are fundamental differences among others. So that's, uh, you know, these are important distinctions. Um, I don't know whether you can sense uh, that that matters or not, but uh, to to my mind it, it matters a great deal. Um, and will, as I say, determine or constrain or divert uh, what unfolds and what opens from practice or doesn't unfold or doesn't open. Um... Sometimes, two people uh, assume that anything with any kind of seemingly uh, mythical element equates as imaginal. It, it doesn't in our, in our uh, teaching, necessarily. Or um, a t- sort of typical archetypes um, uh, must be imaginal. Or limiting the imaginal to sort of... Uh, a predefined set of typical archetypes. Someone was saying, oh, I have four imaginal figures, the king, the, the jester or the tri- trickster, the ascetic or the monk, and the lover. And these are obviously very classic kind of uh, archetypes and sort of tarot, tarot card uh, <coughs> emblems. Um, but, uh, almost stereotypes mainly, but... W- if I do that, if I limit just to these, for example, those four or any other four um, uh, or five or whatever it is, some, I'm limiting the whole logos. I'm limiting um, what I mean by image. I'm, I'm limiting, I will end up limiting uh, my, my practice as a conception affects perception. And if the conception, if the logos is limited, um, it will limit um, the experience, it will send the experience and the interpretation of experience down certain railway tracks with not much possibility or much less possibility of moving off those particular tracks and into um, other areas, more open areas, more fertile areas, more multidirectional areas. Um, so there won't be, in those cases, if, if I'm limiting <coughs> my uh, idea of what's involved in imaginal practice, um, uh, there won't be the kind of infinite and endless possibilities for um, eros, uh, psyche, and logos that we talk about uh, when we kind of describe the underlying workings of the soul-making dynamic. This this idea of the endlessness of possibilities, infinite 
uh, open-ended possibilities for the soul-making dynamic and the fertility there. <coughs> um, so, I know I've said it before, I think it's really, really important. Um, I, uh, yes, I have to say, also given my my health situation and probably dying soon, it, 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 it feels very important to me to make sure that um, all these rich waters of these different traditions don't just get mixed, because in that mixture, uh, something will get lost. Um, and probably the first thing to get lost, being as it is the, the rarest, I think, and in a way somewhat unique, the imaginal uh, paradigm will get lost, what we're calling the imaginal paradigm. So, I think it's wonderful to explore all these other territories if one has the capacity and interest, if one has the interest, you know, um, or if they seem to be opening up. Um, but one can do that and at the same time be really clear about what, what, what makes what what. What are the distinctions? What are the differentiations? How does that affect things? So... Um, In, as I said, when, when, when we use the word image, mostly it's a slightly lazy shorthand for an imaginal image. And imaginal means all those um, elements are involved, the whole soul-making dynamic is involved, etc. And we'll talk a little bit more about it tonight. But um, we can, if you like, make distinctions. I think I might have said this before as well, so... Excuse me. Um, um, sometimes we have an image, uh, let's say, of a situation, but um, we believe that image is true or real, uh, really how things really are, and um, we might call that a fixation, or a fixated image, to be more precise, to make a, I'm going to make, delineate three kinds of relationships with images, which determine actually whether that image is imaginal or not. So we can have a kind of, I believe it, <coughs> um, something happens, a person looks at me in a certain way, I have an image of that person, if you like, a sense of them, a fixated image. We also call it papancha in the Buddhist tradition. So that's one type of image, or image gone down a certain track into fixation. It's become fixated, it's become a real thing. There's not a lot of depth in it. Um, there's not uh, uh, all, all the elements in the soul-making um, uh, dynamic and potential there. So we could call that a fixated image, or papancha. Um, <clears throat> there's also the case where something happens, and an image forms, so let's say this person that looked at me funny, and now I think they hate me, or whatever it is. Um, uh, there's an image, or a story, or fantasy that's running in our mind, about the whole situation, or whatever it is, or about my narrative, or my life, or why does this always happen to me, or I'm like this, or whatever it is, or that person's like that. But in this case, in the second case, uh, we're mindful of the presence of, uh, of, the, of this image. We're mindful of what it is and what's going on in the mind. And um, because of the mindfulness, there's just a, a withdrawal of the, um, uh, the, the credit, if you like, and the, uh, the credulity of it. We're not believing it. Um, so much. So, yes, I noticed that the mind is spinning the story, but because of the mindfulness, just simple mindfulness that we've all been trained in, there's, um, we're aware of what's going on, we're not believing it so much, there's less identification um, with it, we're less lost in it, and less believing it's true, etc. There's some distance to doubt it or to doubt that it's completely true. So we can call that mindfulness, mindful observation um, or awareness of an image. And then there's the third category. So fixated image, mindful uh, observation or awareness of an image is second. And the third category is what we call imaginal. An image that has become imaginal might have started as papancha. This is, you know, this is really important. Um... So it might have started as papancha, but because of the way we skillfully related to it or 
um, worked with it, it became imaginal and opened up all those uh, beautiful and enriching uh, elements of the imaginal, the nodes of the lattice. So, in in that, again, one of the elements is this imaginal middle way. It's neither real nor not real. And that's part of what it means to be imaginal. We naturally sense that. Uh, rather than completely believing it or just completely dismissing it as an irrelevant daydream, just flotsam of the mind, etc., there's this kind of actually quite wide avenue of the imaginal middle way. And that's one of the characteristics of, of the imaginal. It's kind of theatre. So, and because of that, we're less lost in it, less uh, believing it um, uh, completely flat out. So, um, when we talk about freedom in relation to what comes up in the mind, um, certainly when there's um, mindfulness um, of, of an image and mindfulness of that tendency uh, or the stirrings of papancha, um, there's a certain amount of freeing with respect to that image. Um, but uh, when an image becomes imaginal, there's also freedom, uh, a certain freedom, much deeper, richer freedom in relationship to it. Whereas the mindfulness of the image uh, disempowers the image, mindfulness of papancha disempowers the papancha, when there's um, the kind of mindfulness that's involved in imaginal practice, um, when an image becomes imaginal, actually em- empowers the image. So there's freedom, but the image is empowered, instead of freedom at, at, that disempowers the image. You understand? There's also a kind of way that mindfulness of an image in the second category we're talking about, it kind of either just as a disempowers image or just cuts it, drains it of its life, or just holds it kind of static, whereas um, when an image becomes imaginal, uh, it, it, it becomes, it, it's allowed to be dynamic, um, and the, the whole soul-making dynamic with the eros psyche logos dynamic is allowed to infuse it and work on it and ferment it and expand it and deepen and enrich it, etc. Uh, so we could make those distinctions in, in what we mean um, when we use the word image, but as I said, mostly when, when I say the word image, I, I kind of mean imaginal image, it's just a bit of a mouthful. Um, we also use the term fantasy at times, and um, I guess I've used it less, uh, but certainly some. So how would we define a fantasy? It's Again, it's a loose definition. Sometimes I just use the words interchangeably, image and fantasy, imaginal image and fantasy. But in a way, I suppose I think of fantasy as um, something... An image that is a little bit secondary, if you like, or or not so much in the main focus. So usually, when we talk about imaginal practice, like oh, this image came, this um, dancing uh, dancing ape, or whatever whatever it is, this image, and that's an object. And so I'm focusing on that object in the practice, uh, and I can decide how much or how little to focus on it. But fantasy is often something that operates, if you like, more in the background. It's not. It's not the main focus. So fantasies inform our life, if you like, um, inform our uh, sense of our our narrative, but also our, our our choices in life. So where we love deeply, uh, where we are devoted deeply, um, usually that there's a fantasy there. We might not recognize it as a fancy. In other words, there's this kind of uh, imaginal sense of things and of oneself um, that's kind of usually operating a little bit in the background until it becomes we become aware of it as a kind of image that we call a fantasy. And sometimes it, we almost catch these, so to speak, out of the corner of the eye. They're they're not often deliberate um, objects of attention unless we really draw attention to them. So, for example, when we gave those talks about uh, fantasies of the path, mm, different fantasies of the path, um, in a way what we're doing is um, uh, naming something, addressing it, 
giving some possibilities and and then lo and behold people start to become aware of oh I guess this was the fantasy that was operating and maybe this one could operate and this one wants to operate or whatever it is but unless you kind of get imbued um, with imaginal practice and this whole soul making dharma one doesn't often certainly in I guess a lot of mainstream psychologies or mainstream dharma we don't we don't kind of acknowledge that element that strand of our soul of our existence of our way of sensing life so openly so um, when, once we become more involved in imaginal practice we start to see and start to sense um, our whole lives that way and become more aware of the fantasies that are operating Okay, so if we're if we're again just reminding of what we mean um, by image, uh, imaginal image, um, remember and uh, really it seems so worth re- repeating. I'm aware I've said it many times, but um, an image is not necessarily visual. So the word in English tends to connote um, uh, some some visual object, uh, usually, to, uh, usually, but but. When we use the word, it doesn't doesn't necessarily um, mean something visual. I, of course, it can, but uh, all, all the senses involved. And sometimes we can talk about something imaginal, but we're not even sure what sense it's operating in. Which of the six senses it's operating in, or all of them, or none of them, or something else, some intuitive awareness of something. So I'll give try to give some examples. Um, <clears throat> person. Was, I think I gave this example years ago, but a couple of people have mentioned something similar, just um, meditating or just on retreat or somewhere else, and there's a sense of being kissed on the mouth, but I don't see who's kissing me, and yet that the sense of that kiss the the uh, is sensed with soul. There's it's pregnant, it's full of all the beauty, the eros, the meaningfulness, the um, uh, all the other elements of the imaginal that we might um, that we've drawn attention to. So it's a kind of uh, coming through the tactile sense, the kinesthetic sense, um, for example. Um, or a person was describing they were doing meta practice, uh, using the phrases and repeating the phrases. May may I be well? May you be well? Etc. Um, and then she was. Uh, she felt like her hair was being uh, um, combed, uh, with, uh, as if the meta was sort of stroking her hair. The phrases of the meta were stroking her hair. Um, so something's happening already with the sense of the meta there. Um, something's beginning to ferment, to grow, to expand. And this sense of the sort of meta stroking her hair, like combing her hair, um, that then became a kind of image of being attended to uh, by a maid and sort of readied for a banquet, she said. But none of this was visual. So it's just a, a sense. So how do you know? It's a sort of, it's a sort of idea, but but it's a, a lived, fleshed out image. Some of which is kinesthetic, um, and. S- uh, some is just a sense of, of an imaginal scene, if you like, of, of which one is a part, but it's not visual. Um, uh, then, um, in in this sense of things, her heart is suddenly covered in armour. Um, uh, numbness of heart had been something she had experienced and was... Um, she was actually concerned about uh, re- recently, and so here into the image comes the sense of armor, and then, if you like, in response to that uh, that sense of the armor around the heart, the maid's hand came gently to touch the armored heart. Um, all of this uh, non non visual, as an example. Um, and, and again, the, the beauty there, the heart being touched, the emotional resonance, the meaningfulness, the echoing and mirroring of one's life, all these elements present without it being visual, uh, the depth, the dimensionality, all of that. Some of you might have been on a retreat, I, I can't remember which one it was, at Guy House, and it was 
I think it was might have been the foundations of soul making Dharma, and um, it might have been on the opening evening. I can't remember. But we did an exercise, which I think Catherine and I led together, if I remember, and we were chanting the Om Mani Padme Hum, the the the, uh, the mantra of Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of compassion, and uh, this. Some of you who are actually there may not recall this aspect of it because I think at some point we also began milling around the room and coming into contact with each other and of course in the context of silence and strangers and people you love and all, all, all that it can be quite loaded so it might have been that the instructions I was I was giving at, at the time got a little lost but whether or not they did I'll, I'll explain w- what I said and uh, what why it's relevant to what I'm talking about now the non-visual aspect so we were all chanting and we were milling around. And then I asked, I think, if I remember, whose is this compassion? Whose is it? So we introduced the chant with the usual, um, you know, radiating of compassion and care to oneself, to others, etc. So this this mind, this heart, this consciousness um, has the intention of, um, of compassion, of soothing, healing um, towards others, towards all beings, etc., is the usual way we would conceive of that. It's my compassion. But if so, whose is this compassion when we're chanting the mantra? And um, if you like, in asking that question, because uh, I said, oh, it's mine, um, but with the the words of the mantra filling the room, the, 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 the space of the room uh, in which we move, in which we're standing and moving is filled with these syllables, with these sacred syllables and um, chants. And whose is it? So supporting a sense of the mystery of it um, and feeling it kinesthetically that we're in something here. Something is coming through us. Something is touching us from the outside through the sound with the energy body. Um, then we can begin, or the possibility is that compassion itself can be sensed with soul. So it begins to have um, more dimensionality, more unfathomability. Again, these are these are uh, some of the, the nodes that, of the elements of the imaginal. It becomes, we sense it as more than what we have uh, conventionally and habitually conceived of it, uh, how we have conventionally and habitually conceived it and viewed it, as a basically a human quality or intention, become something pertaining to the fabric of the cosmos, something that's, if you like, coming from another level, say the divinity um, of the or the Buddha nature of Avalokiteshvara. It's not just mine. It's coming. It has this dimensionality, this depth. Um, it has an unfathomability. It has a mystery. It has beauty. Um, it's. It's not visual. It's coming through the sound, but the sound itself is enriched and deepened um, through the imaginal sense that's opened through being sensed with soul. It has autonomy. In other words, again, it's not just me deciding to do the compassion. It's just my intention. I generate this compassion. Yes, of course, wonderful. Um, But the the syllables themselves, the sacred syllables of the mantra, the energy of compassion um, has its own autonomy, it has its own intelligence, it has its own will, it has its own presence and its own origin um, and and grace. It's coming, it's not just me intending it, it's gift, all of this. And it's mystery, it becomes as unfathomable in the sense of however I want to... Uh, or however I tend to limit, well, I think, I think I know what compassion means. Compassion means something that wants to alleviate suffering, okay, an intention that wants to alleviate suffering. Yes, great, wonderful definition of compassion. But as we start sensing it with soul, um, the the whole definition, again, it's the soft and elastic edges. It, be, it, be, it begins to ferment, to expand, to grow, to deepen, to enrich. 
Uh, and this is not visual, so it's felt with the body, with the energy body, um, in relation to the sound, in relation to sounding and hearing sound. It's an aural and bodily sense, not, not a visual sense. So that would be another example. But since I keep getting um, uh, notes or or people tell me, oh, I don't get images or I don't see this or that, um, it, it may be worth giving a few more examples um, just to fill out what we mean by image, not so much by definition, but by example. Let's see which ones to give. Um, <clears throat> it's a long story, I suppose, but I, um, you know, I, I used to be a jazz musician, and um, and I gave up. I, I was a composer for a while. I gave up playing, and then I became a composer, and then I gave up, became uh, threw myself into the Dharma full time. Um, but periodically in my life, there are times where I feel um, grief um, at. Uh, I miss music, you know, I miss making music, I miss playing, I miss I miss that whole world. Um, and uh, sometimes what happens is I just get repetitive dreams of uh, p- practicing guitar or playing guitar, and it's like they, they just come and won't go away, and sometimes I start playing again and the dreams go away, and uh, then I stop playing and then they come back. And this has gone on for years and years and years. And as I said, sometimes I feel I feel some grief at that. And it's a, there's a lot to this. I, I'm just being very brief now. But um, <clears throat> so this was one of those days where I had been practicing a little bit guitar, just a little bit, and then stopped. And then the dreams resumed. And um, and again, the, the sort of the the dukkha that went with that, the grief, or the feeling a little bit torn, um, actually between, uh, like I want to, I want to uh, get back into music, but I have other obligations and other other pulls. Um, so I was sitting with that in the morning meditation, and it wasn't particularly intense, um, but I let my mind, uh, or perhaps it was already generating. Um, sort of music in, in my mind, it's sort of improvised uh, melodies and lines and a picture of a guitar and all that, um, <clears throat> with all the difficulty of, of the situation and, and other, other factors. Um, but I let myself listen to the music. I let the music play in the, in the mind. Um, uh, and there's a kind of looseness and fluidity, and, and, it, and it begins to feel wonderful. It's beautiful, and, and there's something powerful in it. And then, uh, so, it again, it's a gradual transition, something that kind of actually was a bit of a daydream that, that actually was involved with some dukkha, some dukkha, then kind of daydream. And then it begins to take on other dimensions. It begins to grow as I, as I go into that, what seemed like a daydream, and and kind of pay attention to it with, with a bit more... Uh, Respect and reverence, I guess. Um, then, at, s- at a certain point, I get a sense of music as a god. Um, it a, a pitch black, featureless god, like like black empty space, um, featureless, but somehow with many long waving arms, the way Avalokiteshvara has. Um, but again, it's not visual. I can't explain exactly how I get the sense of those arms. And that if 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 that aspect of the image, the arms, um, was prominent at first, it soon faded very much to the background. And what became the prominent uh, aspect of the image, and and the the aspect that was at that time the most soulful, the most soul making. So again, this instruction to kind of hone in and tune to whatever in an image feels the most soul making. We'll come back to this. Um, this god definitely felt masculine somehow, um, and it felt like he has a claim on me. This god of music has a claim on me, on my soul and my life. Um, and in recognizing this claim and surrendering to it, I feel a relief and a kind of understanding. It's like I understand something about my life, about my narrative. 
my surrender to it feels to me like a feminine mode. I'll put those in inverted commas. Um, <clears throat> as if I'm being taken. I'm taken by this God. Um, and there is an awareness that he is greater than me, much more powerful than me, this God, as all gods are. All that feels very beautiful and, and blissful in my whole body, and particularly in the lower belly. And I understand with it, it's not so much that it has to manifest materially. I don't have to be um, a musician again. Um, I seem, in fact, not to be one of those chosen for that fully, or throughout my life at least. Um, but I understand that this God music, infinite in his possibilities, has a claim on me. Almost as if from behind, so to speak, in in the sense that it, it might not be the principal thing I'm directly focusing on or devoted to or attending to or working on. But whatever that principal thing is, um, Dharma or whatever, you know, uh, there will always be flitting in and out with more or less intensity um, the pull, the claim of this, this pitch black God. Um... And again, this teaching of the polydirectional pulls of the different gods and the impossibility of serving them all fully um, in, in the literal ways uh, that might seem obvious to us. Um, so again, maybe it had just a, a, a suggestion of, an imag- of a visual element right at the beginning, but actually um, the sense of of that, you could say what became image was I, I became image, or the sense of my narrative, myself, my narrative self became imaginal in relationship to this um, very powerful god of music. But it wasn't really um, visual like that. Um, and then the, 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 these kinds of images around music and working with music and, and the grief that I sometimes feel about leaving it. Uh, there was there are periods of time where it sort of comes quite regularly, and I'm working with it over over maybe even a few weeks on and off. Um, but it's quite hard to articulate how one how one kind of senses that. What sense is it being known through? Um, the claim of this God is is like a a kind of light or a shadow cast over my life. But I'm using those words metaphorically. um, And it's from elsewhere, so to speak, uh, permeating my life or like a canopy over it. And um, the the redemption, the opening up and the soul-making come in the relationship to it, in the recognizing, acknowledging, surrendering it to it, seeing myself, sensing myself with soul, my narrative with soul, and and all that. Some days later, I think, um, there's another, actually, I alluded to at the beginning of that description, um, there's a way that uh, can be sort of listening to music in my mind's eye, I mean, my mind's ear, so to speak, Um, And it's not necessarily crystal clear. It might be or it might not be. Um, But then it kind of opens up a realm of music, like a cosmic realm, a sort of space of abstract music, if you like, Um, like infinitely fecund uh, realm or world of of, that's just music, just just continual outpouring of, of music. And and I think I've touched on this many uh, uh, many retreats ago. Um, that kind of opening uh, to this sense, an imaginal sense of a realm of music. Again, it's not visual here; it's aural. And even then, sometimes the aural begins to fade a little bit and becomes even more abstract. But it's definitely music, and it's definitely beautiful, and it's definitely a realm. And that can open up a kind of cosmopoesis in the moment um, with respect to the sounds that are actually around me, the birds and the uh, wind and the cars even and, and whatever else, or people's, people's voices, etc. Very beautiful. And so, so the sensing the soul spreads to um, the whole environment. Um, <clears throat> then, just following on this little series there, I was, uh, I think I was driving, this is some months ago, um, uh, 
driving to Guy House, I think, and I was listening to music in the car. And actually, I wasn't that into it, um, or I found it a bit, the particular thing that I was listening to, I found it a bit boring and predictable. Um, but something happened because I then got a sense, um, a soul sense of my relationship with music, of music's claim on me, um, as, as I was uh, explaining before, its power, its presence in, over, and through my life, uh, getting a sense of it as more refracted. Um, so re- refraction means, you know, when light hits water, it deflects, uh, to, to doesn't follow a straight line, it, 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 it bends to one side. Um, that's one of the meanings of refraction. So in the same way, this music, this presence of music in my life is refracted, um, so that it's not actual music, uh, so much as the image of music, uh, refracted or radiating or shining into my life somehow. It's the image of music. It's not actual music. And instead of feeling sort of that, that subtle grief or disempowerment, um, grieving the impossibility of actual music, um, right now in my life, there is an empowering, as if this is exactly right, that I have other manifestations to steward, um, to give and receive right now in my life. I'm going to give a couple more examples um, of non, non-visual non images. Um, I had a dream that a Dharma teacher colleague... Um, well, there was sort of all I remembered in the morning was sort of fragments of the dream. So um, there was uh, the house where I grew up, and something about the sun shining, and a, a student um, of mine, and and a Dharma teacher colleague. And she said, um, "This is um, almost a year ago." She says, y- y- "You're going to die soon, and uh, relatively soon." Um, but she said something about you need to take care of your legacy, or because, you know, it, it, there's a powerful uh, possibility here and you need to take care of that. And so just these fragments of a dream. And in the meditation in the morning, I, I remembered the dream, uh, or remembered the fragments at least, and um, then sort of let those fragments go. And after they went, there was a sort of imaginal sense of my dying soon. And not being here, being dead, so not being present, um, not being a presence in the world, um, a physical presence in the world. Um, So there's a sense of an absence. Um, But this absence becomes a very powerful kind of presence or force in the world. Um, So again, where's the... There's no visual object there at all. It's actually an absence. Um, But that absence has this imaginal sense to it. It was full full of the elements, including the neither real nor not real, and, and all of that, and the beauty, and the echoing. It's very hard to describe. How do I, how do I sense that? Somehow, again, in the infinite echoing and mirroring, that, that, um, that in order for that to be imaginal, or to, in that moment, it had to be connected with um, a recent sort of decision and intention, resolution I had to try to study certain areas, um, including ethics uh, in relation to soul and and, and uh, nature of matter and things like that. Um, and so somehow that was part of what allowed it to be image, that intention and sort of channeling of my will and energies feels felt powerful in itself, but it's somehow fused with or impregnates with life force um, and direction and power that imaginal absence uh, that comes from death. So again, not, not a visual image at all. Very hard to articulate. Um, let, me, let me give a couple more. Um, this is quite recent, maybe a couple of months ago, um, or a month, like, yeah, six weeks ago, I don't know. Um, I was uh, being taken somewhere to the doctors, I think, or something like that. And um, it was a sunny day, early spring, very beautiful. And I had my eyes open in the car. And 
an image came of my chest uh, opening uh, as if it was uh, as if it was a kind of cupboard opening with two two doors opening, but actually in the, the imaginal sense of it was more like the uh, what we what was called in in the Jewish tradition the ark or the Aron Hakodesh the uh, the basically a kind of um, uh, tabernacle uh, or holy receptacle cupboard where where they keep the um, the holy Torah the the, the scrolls. And um, so as if my chest was opening like that. Um, and again, I'm not sure it was really that visual. It was more a kinesthetic sense with this association with it. But it felt very open and blessed. And it had vague traces of um, the sense of, or the idea of me or my body as sacred text, like, like the Torah scroll. Again, this is more, perhaps more an idea than um, a, a visual image. This idea of self or body, a sacred text of, of something opening in the chest. But it combined with, this sense then combined with um, a sense of, if you like, straddling two worlds. The world of life and the world of death. And I'm not even sure what I mean by that exactly. Um, uh, a sense of different planes of existence, um, of this plane of obvious material manifestation being just one plane, other realms, other dimensions, if you like, um, that maybe have a different, uh, cast a different light on death. So there was a sense of myself then um, with this probability, I suppose, of, of dying in the near future, straddling these two worlds, being somehow in both worlds at once, the world of life and the world of death. And with that straddling, um, tremendous softness and surrender and letting go and peace, and the, the gaze, uh, the way that I, the ways in which I then saw the world around me and the situation uh, and and uh, the, the the fields and the trees and the sky, um, the sense of all that, the gaze on this life um, and the world was one. There was so much sense of mercy and compassion and beauty, and it felt in that moment all, all and any kind of gross level of clinging to life um, was gone. So it was really a sense of blessedness and peace. Um, and it also felt like the blessings pour, poured forth from my being, from my chest, from my eyes. So something very, very lovely. Um, so those two aspects, the opening of the chest and the, the sort of sacred text, the holy, uh, the place of the holy scrolls, the straddling of life and death with all the peace and beauty that that gave to the sense of things, all things. And then the third aspect was a kind of um, immediate cosmopoesis. Right then, the the sense of the land that we were um, driving through um, was perceived as having its own intelligence, its own life in a way which I don't think I'd, partic- I'd, I'd experienced before. So something quite new, again, very hard to pinpoint, this this land has intelligence, um, something I've touched on before, but it, the particular experience there was quite new. So um, all three of those aspects, and they opened simultaneously, actually, were uh, uh, experienced together. I maybe had touched on each of them individually um, in the weeks before, uh, in, in practice, um, uh, formal or informal, um, but they they kind of came together then. The eyes were open, um, the land was sensed with soul, um, the sense of death and my life and narrative, they're all equally important integrated aspects of, of that image. Uh, I don't know whether we'd call that an intrapsychic image or not, um, but 
partly want to say it's not visual, partly want to give give a sense of how images can actually become quite complex constellations um, in in very lovely ways, um, fusing together different uh, different aspects, if you like. Um, Okay, last one um, of an example of something not visual. Um, uh, sitting in meditation and letting my body sense lead um, uh, with, with the whole energy body and that awareness and letting that kind of guide the practice and guide me. And I sense in the meditation then that I'm being tended to lovingly by angels. Uh, tender presences they feel excuse me, they feel very, again, feminine, quote, um, but it's not visual, um, so it's just the something that feels feminine there, um, I'm not seeing them, I'm, I'm feeling something, I'm sensing something, but I can't exactly tell you uh, what sense it's coming through, it's probably more kinesthetic than anything else, but even that is quite, uh, the, the sensual detail is quite vague, and uh, not clear, not sharp, not um, distinct, but the imaginal sense is very strong. This is what's happening. Tender, loving angels are ministering to me. To me. It feels very beautiful and very delightful. Um, it's not clear whether they are tending my corpse after my death, this sort of transition to, you know, to death, or... Um, or whether they are healing uh, my still living body. Um, something about that uncertainty, is it this or is it this? Is it healing or is it actually a sort of image of beyond depth, of, 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 of a, a attending and ministering to a corpse uh, that's been through the trials and tribulations and w wearying difficulties of the life and illness and all that, and now uh, receives... Uh, this, these loving, tender, angelic ministrations after death. Uh, that uncertainty, is it this or that? It, it seemed somehow necessary to it. Um, uh, the, the answer to was it this or that wasn't forthcoming. It seemed like the, the, um, uh, it wasn't right. So I let it go and just open to the ministration. So much love there. So much love. Um, again, a sense, um, uh, perhaps at this point becoming slightly visual, but um, but not predominantly visual, of, of water being poured on me like like anointed or like uh, uh, bathed um, with again with tenderness, with blessing. Uh, my body being stroked. Um, uh, water poured on my head like that. So those are some examples um, of images that are not visual. Uh, and just to labour the point and, and to, to, to open up in case some, some people are still stuck on the, on the sort of demanding vi visual objects um, in their imaginal practice. If we, again, just linger a little bit, what do we mean by imaginal? I'm just filling out some things... Uh, not everything, just a few things tonight. Um, so obviously we can have image um, as other, like we said here is this dancing ape I am looking at or seeing this, this dancing ape, this image. So the image is an object there. But also the self can become image. And that will happen anyway, as we've talked about. And I want to um, go into that in a little more detail in this series of talks, how the self gets... Um, can and should get involved in in the imaginal sense and become uh, itself imaginal. Um, but it could be that the prim primary image is the self, um, or it takes place here as opposed to an object seemingly over there in the psychic space. So, uh, for example, again, I was sitting, there was uh, a lot of things that happened in the last few days, there was a lot of sort of um, emotional uh, resonances and uh, stirrings still still present in the heart from all these different things that had happened in those days. And, and suddenly, out of the heart centre, or the solar plexus centre, I can't remember, um, came, came this image of a sort of 
bare, uh, bare branch tree, like a tree in winter, or almost black tree. And suddenly, um, it uh, so it grew out of my chest. But suddenly, it became uh, it, it, it 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 burst into blossom, a beautiful blossom. And I, I was that tree, or rather, that tree was in the place of my body. So the image there is the self has become image, and the location in psychic space is here. In my body has become um, the image, as opposed to uh, it's over there, an object that I'm looking at. So both are possible. Um, uh, it's also one, one another thing we've talked about this. Um, this node, this element of create, discover. Images are created, discovered. So this is an important uh, thing. It's an important element, as as they all are, in fact. But um, one of the implications of this element of create, discover is that it's actually okay if you deliberately um, deliberately invoke an image or deliberately change an image or deliberately bring back an image that touched you before in another um, another time. Um, that's potentially, potentially just as valid as an image that comes completely out of the blue, unbeckoned, it's brand new, fresh, I didn't do anything, it seems, to, to uh, create this. Um, so we tend to think, oh, if I if I made it happen, or if I make this happen in, in an image, or if I change an image this way, it has to be ego, and ego is something other than the unconscious, or ego is something other than soul, and all, all that stuff. You know, I don't buy into that distinction. I would I would rather say um, either way is okay. Whether whether an image just comes unbidden and surprisingly and uh, um, it, it seems like pure grace, great. Or whether it seems like something I've generated or even a guided meditation I'm following or I'm resurrecting an image, revisiting an image, re-invoking an image that I've had before, whatever it is. What matters, rather than who made this, is, is it soul-making? Um, and if it feels soul-making, it doesn't matter that I've made it, that I've created it, I just added something to that image or took something away or changed it or, or whatever. What matters is the sense of soul making. So even if it comes completely unbidden and it's got all the, you know, m- mythical sort of um, qualifications and, and it's, oh, this must be an image. If it doesn't feel soul making, it's not in our language imaginal yet. So uh, what matters is the soul making sense. That's one of the no's as well. It's soul making. Yes, that's what makes it imaginal. And this is what we should use to guide us. Um, are we on the right track? Uh, is also part of how we uh, support an image to become more imaginal and to deepen. It's by, as I said earlier uh, tonight, tuning in to what's actually, what feels, the, what are the soulful or soul-making aspects of this image? An image is a complex thing. Um, what um, parts or dimensions of the image actually feel the ones that, that are the ones that feel soulful and that's what we should gently tune into linger with feel explore etc so this business about i shouldn't make something happen or, or this because that's ego or whatever um i wouldn't put too much stock by that okay a couple of last things for tonight um uh, when we talk about the nodes or the elements of the imaginal, or can we call them aspects of the imaginal of, of the lattice? At times we've used those three words: nodes, elements, and aspects. So, um, when we talk about them, and again, I think this may have been something I said before, but it bears repeating. Um, I would say um, it's not that we're just talking about something that. Uh, the, these elements as being kind of on-off switches. I mean, they are sometimes. So a node suddenly fires. Suddenly there's um, a sense of divinity, or suddenly the eros is there, or whatever it is. You know, um, so like an on-off switch um, or on-off settings. Uh, sometimes they're more like each each node itself, each element itself is more like a spectrum, or more like a kind of dimmer switch. Um, so, 
you know, when, it, when it's an on-off, it can feel a lot more passive. It's just something that just happened. Okay, it happened to me. Suddenly something ignited. This switch just got flipped into the on, on position. When it's a dimmer switch, there's actually the possibility of, you know, our intention turning the dial, turning the dimmer switch. Um, or if we use the, I think we've used the analogy of fire, like this this flame then igniting another flame. Or f- a flame also is something that can have, you know, you can turn the, the gas higher or lower, or so to speak, put more wood on the fire, etc. So that fire is is not so much on or off only, it also has a dimmer switch. Um, so <clears throat> it's good to think of... Um, uh, to, to, to the model of a sudden sparking, sudden ignition um, of one node, and that node um, in its sudden sparking then triggering or igniting suddenly the sparking of other nodes or elements. That, that's, a, that's a good model. It conveys um, something of the sort of sudden change of state or sort of quantum leap that can often occur in imaginal practice, <coughs> either on one's own um, or, or when practicing with another. Um, but other times, the experience of the individual nodes is, is more like, uh, as I said, dials or faders. We can turn any one of them up by simply noticing it, paying attention to that node um, uh, element, and that noticing itself, that that kind of delicate attention to it, without pressure, actually starts to either ignite it or turn it up, turn that element up in the experience. And then maybe the whole the whole lattice, the other nodes, are then gradually turned up, or it may be they suddenly uh, turn up when once a certain threshold has been reached of the first element. Uh, there's a sort of sudden ignition of, of others. So there's lots of possibilities here. Um, and again, I think I might have mentioned this before, but um, with practice, gradually... Gradually, with the development of sort of skill and art in this, uh, we might call it alchemy of imaginal practice, we may be able to guide the kind of relative balance of the settings, so to speak, of any two or even more of these dials, of these elements. So, for example, um, attention to the energy body is an element, and it might be um, in the background, a sort of background awareness, and we can turn up the dial of that and become more immersed in in the sense of the energy body. And maybe it's very pleasant in a certain kind of way and it, and it takes us into jhana. And the image as object goes, um, uh, relatively speaking, becomes uh, more in the background. So we can start to alter the relative balance of, of these different dials, if you like, or these different flames. Um, or with uh, emotion... It might come to the fore or less, or the sense of real, not real, can come to the fore, or um, we can bring it to the fore, we can turn up these dials through our noticing or through tweaking them in certain ways. It takes it takes practice, usually takes time to develop that kind of skill, but it's similar a, a little bit. Some of you will know from certainly the way I would teach insight practice and its relationship to samadhi, that there might be, uh, one might be, practicing certain insight ways of looking and again there's uh, because they bring letting go they bring ease in the energy body uh, and un, a relative unbinding of clinging and the knots in the energy body that starts to feel quite nice and we can we can lean a little bit more into the awareness and enjoyment of that pleasant feeling in the energy body and that's um, taking us in the direction of the samadhi and less less uh, priority to the insight at that point. We can play with any kind of relative degree of balance of the insight way of looking in the samadhi at that point. And the metaphor I gave um, for that uh, previously was like like a hawk or any of those birds of prey that ride the thermal air currents. And when they change direction, it's, it's a very subtle sort of just inclining the wings this way or that way, even just a part of the wing, and it takes them in a different direction. It's almost like they're picking up opportunistically on currents that are already there. We pick up on currents that are already there, on uh, flames, thermals, if you like, that are already there in the imaginal practice or in the insight samadhi practice, whatever it is. And um, in in just the subtlest of realignment uh, through the attention, it changes the direction of practice. So that's very possible. 
I had said um, wanting to be clear about um, what we mean by um, imaginal, and so explaining with all the elements and the 28 elements and this and that, um, but also that in a way it's not so black and white. So we can talk about um, something, uh, an image becoming more fully imaginal or more authentically imaginal. And again, there's a spectrum here, you know, from let's say Papancha on one side through um, something having more and more of the elements, if you like, or a, a, a richer and deeper involvement um, of each element, um, and then it becomes more and more fully imaginal. So partly that's just a description of the unfolding experience, um, sometimes. Um, but partly I say also for pedagogical reasons, because some people hear the teaching of, oh, I don't know, maybe I've never had an imaginal experience. Um, uh, and another kind of person, or the same person at different time, might be a, a, of a mind um, that says, uh, just automatically assumes that any image that they have um, is is imaginal in the sense that we're meaning it. And so, again, so, so much about teaching is sort of contextual and relative to each student or each student at a certain time. Um, so somehow there's this middle way where it's a spectrum. So it, where we can talk about becoming more fully imaginal. What that means is don't necessarily believe, if you have a tendency to think, oh, I don't know what Rob and Catherine are talking about, I don't think I've ever had any such experience, I probably never will have, and I don't know this, and I can't do that, and da 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 um, Trust that you're on a spectrum, and you can grow, uh, the experiences can grow, the explorations can grow more, more and more into what we call the fully or authentically imaginal, what we call the fully or authentically imaginal. Um, and for the other kind of person, it uh, th- these teachings about the nodes and um, uh, might might be um, important to to say. Well, hold, hold on. If you think something's imaginal, just check. Has it got all these other factors in it? Um, all these other elements, because that's what we mean. So what you're calling imaginal may not actually be fully what we mean yet, or what's possible in in the directions that we're talking about. So it's tricky. You know, it's tricky as a teacher. Uh, obviously, it's tricky as a student. But um, but if we think of it as a spectrum, I think it's helpful in all kinds of ways. <clears throat> There's a a uh, saying from the Zogchen tradition, trust your experience, but keep refining your view. So in the Zogchen tradition, it's it's in relationship to the view of Zogchen, or a certain emptiness view, let's say. Um, trust your experience, but keep refining your view. So I think that's so much wisdom in that. And that, that this goes for the imaginal practice, it goes also for emptiness practices. Um, we, we have certain experiences, a certain level of insight, and it may well be, it often is, that we can those they, they can be deepened. That that level of understanding or insight, that level of experience, if you like, can be deepened and enriched. So I'm not throwing out my experience um, of images or imagination or, or I'm, I'm trusting that, but I keep refining my view. What else is there? What's different here? What's what's maybe am I not seeing? What's possible? Um, what are some of these other elements, etc.? that I maybe haven't um, experienced or incorporated or understood yet. So trust your experience and keep refining your view. I'm also reminded of uh, 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 Ajahn Chah talking one time. He said, you know, as a teacher, I'm like, I'm like someone um, saying, walking, walking by my students as they walk down the road, and there's ditches on, as, uh, on each side of the road trenches on each side of the road and if I see a student veering too much to the left and in danger of falling in that ditch I say go right go right move move to the right and if that same student or another student looks like at a certain time they're in danger of falling into the ditch on the right hand side of the road then I say go left go left so teaching is always contextual it's always relative to the student where they are at that time what their kind of mindset and um if you like, patterns of psychology are all, all of that. So um, each individual at any time needs a kind of slightly different emphasis. 
Um, one of my teachers, Ajahn Jeff, Ajahn Tanisaro, uh, when I studied jhanas with him uh, many years ago, um, he said, uh, I'm pretty sure he said, um, you know, uh, you think if you think you've had an experience and you think, oh, that's the first jhana or that's the third jhana or whatever it is, just, just put post-it notes on it um, for a while. You know, those post-it notes, those sticky, you know, sticky labels. Um, because then you can what will happen is your experience will mature and it will change. So if you've had an experience of the, what you think was the first jhana, you think, oh, that must be the first jhana. As you practice more with that, with that state, it starts to change through practice. It, it, it refines, it matures, it grows. It starts to differently say, oh, actually, that was two states and I got them mixed up and that one's that and that one's that, um, as well as the experience itself changing. So... Um, we could talk a lot in terms of jhanas. I won't. I won't talk about that now. But I think um, there'd be some wisdom with saying something very similar um, for imaginal practice. Um, think, oh, this is imaginal, or that wasn't imaginal. Just put a post-it note on it. Just be be light with the with the labeling or the have I achieved this or that. You know, um, it's a it's a real kindness, and it allows things to grow. Uh, as you grow into discovering uh, more of what's involved and what we mean by imaginal. Last thing to say right now is that um, all of the elements in the imaginal, so all of those 28 elements that we've uh, listed and outlined and talked about elsewhere, um, they all have, as I uh, alluded to briefly before, they all have kind of soft and elastic edges. Um, each of them is unfathomably deep and infinitely developable. Um, they each of them are created, discovered. So again, what that means is um, humility, or um, divinity, or dimensionality, or um, beauty. Um, each of these and, and each of the those might mean something to us at this point in time in our life and our practice, but because they have soft and elastic edges, they can be stretched. What does beauty mean? What does it encompass? Um, uh, what does divinity mean and encompass? What does humility mean and encompass? Can can get stretched. Its meaning can get expanded, deepened, enriched, um, become itself multi-dimensional, multi-aspected. As I alluded to right at the beginning tonight, um, things that are both foundations or roots or elements of imaginal practice them, themselves become ensouled, and, and we go on a journey with that, or they expand and teach us. Um, they are unfathomably deep. We never come to the end of what humility means, certainly never come to the end of what divinity might mean, um, or beauty, uh, and infinitely developable. And we are involved in that. Yeah. So this is all um, part of, I think, what we need to bear in mind as we sort of uh, walk this path of soul-making dharma and practice. Um, just helping in the sense of, some of it's for clarity's sake, some of it's for attitude's sake. What's, a, what's an attitude that nourishes the practice, that gives it space to grow, that gives it good soil uh, so that it can be really fertile? Okay, I think that's enough for tonight. Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.